In this lesson, we will look at understanding rates of reaction graphs. Now, if you missed any of the other videos in this playlist or in this section, go check out the links below. Firstly, when we speak about graphs in physics or chemistry, it is extremely important that you take note of a few important things relating to the graph. So you might get a heading that tells you what the graph is about. But the most important thing for me is you need to look, take note of the variable, the quantity listed on the y axis and the quantity listed on the x axis. Now, in most cases in this section, what will be listed on the x axis will be time. However, it's not always time. That's why you need to look very carefully at the x-axis. And on the y-axis, this axis over here, we can represent a number of different variables. Remember, to represent a reaction rate or how quickly a reaction is taking place, we need to represent time on the x-axis because it is basically what is happening as time is going on. And how to calculate the rate of reaction, we look at how quickly the reactants are being used up or how quickly products are being formed. Because what happens as a reaction goes on is we start with reactants and as time goes on, so remember a graph looks like this, as time goes on, as we move this way along the x-axis, the reactants get used up. So you might see a curve looking something like this. The reactants get used up and what happens to the products? Products get produced. So we start with zero products and as the reaction goes on, the curve increases like that. So it's very important to understand what we are measuring, what we are looking at. So when measuring the rate of reaction, we go from reactants to products, we can decide depending on the experiment, depending on the investigation, depending on what we are looking at, we can either have this axis, the y axis being concentration, maybe mass, it could maybe even be volume in um, cubic, sorry, this is moles per cubic decimeter for concentration, volume in cubic decimeters, maybe it's mass loss. So how much mass is lost as time goes on? So if we take a look at our first graph over here, we can see that we have time along my x-axis and concentration, as I mentioned, usually measured in moles per cubic decimeter along my y-axis. And as I mentioned, we start off with reactants or reagents. That's just another word for reactants. We start off with a certain amount, a certain concentration of reactants. And as the reaction goes on, the concentration of those reactants decreases because the reactants get used up. Okay, and if we are speaking about the limiting reagent, the reagent or the reactant that is going to run out first, then my graph, so it'll start somewhere up here and then it will run until there's no more left of that reactant, until my concentration is zero. Right, so that is what happens to the reactants. What happens to the products? Products represented by this pink uh, red curve over here. We start with no products and then as time goes on, as we go this way, the amount of products that we produce increases, the concentration of products increase. Let's pretend I have mass or volume formed. So remember, what are we making? We are making products. So this would be the mass of the product or the volume of the product and versus, versus time. So at the beginning of the reaction, there's no product. So we start down here. As the reaction goes on, there will be an increase in the amount of mass or volume formed. So the curve will do something like this. Then as time goes on, it increases until eventually you will see a flattening out of the curve like that. So the curve starts to level out, it starts to become flat. What's happening here when the curve starts to become flat over there? What that means, let's say that that happens at 30 seconds, more or less. What that means is that it takes 30 seconds for all the product to be formed. And then after 30 seconds, the mass or volume of product stays constant. You can see there's no more increase in mass or volume. That means that the reaction has reached completion. The reaction is over. And as you can see, the line is flat. Okay, so when you see a flat line like this, it means that the reaction is done. And what is extremely important to note about rates of reaction graphs like this is that if we have time on the x-axis like we do over here, then the gradient of this graph, okay, the gradient represents the rate of reaction. So can you see that over here, if I have to take the gradient over here, you agree that this is a flat line, a horizontal line, okay? So the gradient of this piece of the graph is zero. The gradient is zero, which means the rate of reaction is zero. It means that the reaction has reached completion. It has come to an end. No more product is being produced. So the gradient, as I mentioned, represents the rate of reaction.
you should know what a tangent is. A tangent is here, a straight line that's touching the curve. If I have to take the gradient of this tangent over here, or think about it as the gradient of this piece of the graph. Can you see that in the beginning, the gradient of that graph, that curve would be very steep. But as the reaction goes on, can you see that the gradient becomes less steep? And as we go on, the gradient becomes even less steep. And as we go on, the gradient becomes less steep. I hope you can see that the, the steepness of the line is decreasing until we get to a flat horizontal line over here where the gradient is zero. So if I had to break up this graph into sections, A to B, which would represent this part of the reaction, versus B to C, which would be this part of the reaction, and then C till completion, which would be kind of there, that part of the reaction, which piece, which segment of the reaction would have the highest rates of reaction? You would say A, B, that beginning part of the reaction has the highest rates of reaction, and your reason would be because it has the steepest gradient, it has the biggest gradient. And the gradient decreases as you go along the curve as time goes on. In this graph, I am comparing two different scenarios over here, two different experiments. Curve number one, the dotted line, represents one reaction. And curve number two represents a second reaction. It might not be very obvious in this graph. I hope it is. But reaction number one, the, the dotted line, reaches completion. So the curve starts to flatten out at T1. But reaction number two, the solid line, starts to flatten out at T2. What that means is that reaction number one has a steeper gradient. So compare these lines, the steepness of the solid line versus the dotted line. Can you see that the dotted line is more steep? It has a steeper gradient, steeper gradient than the solid line. So the steeper gradient, the steeper curve means that reaction number one has a higher rate of reaction. And reaction two... Less steep gradients, smaller gradients, therefore lower rates of reaction. So maybe reaction number one took place at a higher temperature, like we dealt with in the collision theory video. Higher temperature means more effective collisions per unit time, so higher rates of reaction. Maybe reaction two took place at a lower temperature. But what is interesting to note is that in this particular experiment, the maximum amount of product formed was the same for both of the reactions. So this would definitely indicate something like a temperature change. So increasing the temperature doesn't mean that one reaction suddenly makes more product. It just means it makes the same amount of product, but quicker. The reaction finishes earlier versus if it was at a lower temperature, the reaction finishes later. Remember, a reaction finishes when the curve starts to level out, when it starts to go flat. So what's important to note is reaction one takes less time to complete than reaction two. So reaction one finishes sooner it finishes after T1 seconds. Maybe T1 is 30, maybe T2 is 60. So because reaction one levels out, it comes to completion, it reaches completion earlier, it means that reaction one has a higher rate of reaction. Because remember, rate is, we would measure it using this graph, using, let's say, mass, change in mass over change in time. So think about this mathematically, put your math brains on. The smaller your time is, so if your time is 30 seconds versus 60, so let's say it's 30, it's smaller. The smaller this value is, the bigger rate will be. So the lower time, the less time your reaction takes, the higher the rate of your reactions. So maybe a graph like this would be make it a little bit easier to see. You can see that graph A and graph B, same final volume of oxygen that is produced, 60 cubic decimeters is the final volume of oxygen that is produced in both cases, but graph A has a steeper gradient and the graph starts to level out. Do you see that it becomes constant? The volume of gas, the volume of product becomes constant a lot earlier, becomes constant at 60 seconds for graph A versus 120 seconds for graph B. Here, reaction A reaches completion after 60 seconds. So it's where your graph starts to level out. And reaction B, look at curve B, the second line underneath this one, that reaches completion, where does it start to flatten? Only over here. Reaches completion after 120 seconds. Here are some other graphs that also represent the rates of reaction. Take note that time again is on the x-axis for both of these graphs. These graphs are both representing mass in one way. So this is mass of, mass of flask and contents. Remember one of the reactions, uh, one of the experiments that we can use to measure rates of reaction is if we have our conical flask or our beaker and we have our reactants reacting in here and we have a gas that's escaping and we put this on a scale then what will happen is as the gas escapes, so the gas 
the gaseous product will escape, then the mass of this beaker will decrease. So the mass will start out very high. Then as the gas escapes, the product, which one of the products could be a gas, as it escapes, the mass of the beaker will decrease with time. That makes sense. It's showing that a reaction is occurring because the gas is escaping, which results in a decrease in mass. Or we could measure the amount of mass lost over time. So again, because the gas escapes as a product, maybe in the first 30 seconds of the reaction, a certain amount of gas translates into 10 grams being lost. And then as time goes on and more gas escapes, after six, 60 seconds in the reaction, maybe that corresponds to 15 grams being lost. So the amount of mass that is lost increases as time goes on. That makes sense. And again, the key thing is that when the graph goes flat like this, when there is no further change in the mass of the flask and the contents, or there's no further change in mass loss, it stays constant, it means that the reaction has reached completion. The reaction is finished. The rate of the reaction is zero because the gradient is zero. It's a horizontal graph. It's flat. But over here, in the beginning of the reaction, the gradient of the graph is very steep, as time goes on, the gradient of the graph decreases. I hope you can see until the gradient is zero. Same thing here. Initially, the gradient is very steep. As time goes on, look at my red curve, it starts to flatten. The gradient of the graph becomes zero. Another type of graph that you might see, now again, remember, look at the axes. Along the y-axis, we have something called rate. And look at the, the variable, one over time. On the x-axis, we have temperature. So remember, when you have a graph, just as a side note, the thing that is on the x-axis is always your independent variable. This is how I remember it, independent. And what is on your y-axis is your dependent variable. Remember, the dependent variable is what we are measuring. So if we go back to, say, for example, this graph, we are measuring the volume of oxygen gas that is being produced. We are measuring the volume of the product. That is the thing that we are measuring. And the thing that is changing is the time. So in this graph, the thing that we are measuring is the rate of the reaction. The, the physical quantity that we are changing is the temperature. So for example, we can do a reaction at a low temperature, 10 degrees Celsius, and then we can do one at 20, and we can do one at 80, somewhere down here. And we can see how does that change the rate of the reaction. So you should know, well, ma'am, in the previous videos, you taught us that as the temperature increases, the rate of the reaction will increase. So we should see an increasing graph like that. So let's just chat about what this rate thing means. Remember, how do we measure the rate of the reaction? I dealt with this in the first introductory video and also my calculations video on how to calculate the rate of reaction. The definition says we measure the change in concentration of reactants or products per unit time. We are dividing by time. And remember, I mentioned that the top of the fraction can be change in concentration, but it can also be change in mass, or it can be change in volume or change in moles. The definition just says change in concentration, but it can be any of these. But the key here is when we are talking about rates, we are dividing by time. And think about this, if you're dividing by time, okay, let's just put a one up here. If you're dividing by time, what is the unit that time is measured in? It's measured in seconds. If you take seconds to the top of the fraction, it becomes S minus 1. That's why the unit for rate is to the power of negative 1. Seconds to the power of negative 1. That is rate, okay? If we're talking about 1 over time, that's where the S to the power of negative 1 comes from. So as the temperature increases, as we go this way, the rate of the reaction increases. Now, there are other graphs that you can see pop up in the section rates of reaction. For example, these graphs our potential energy diagrams for exothermic and endothermic reactions. And we also have the Maxwell-Boltzmann curves. I will deal with these graphs in other videos in this playlist. So you don't want to miss those. I'll see you in another video very soon, everybody. Bye.